sacrament of the altar. Amen. Let's start with the memorari to Our Lady. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember, O oh most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Before I start, I want to promote some of the sisters' work. Um, we are planning, I am planning for them, and with them, a retreat, a very special retreat at St. Meinrad's uh, coming up in a, in a few months. It's a time that we could have separate from uh, the, the ministry and just to be together and have some teaching and some one-on-one -on -one with the sisters that I uh, need to do with them for their formation. So they work very hard at the crafts and the things that they make to raise funds, and this this money will be go that will that will go to um, to their retreat. It will make it possible. So I'm just thinking. I think it would be a really cute Easter basket. There's the bean soup, and it's got all the fixins inside, uh, and they have some really beautiful soaps that they have put together too. It would make really nice gifts, and it would be a big help uh, for them. Okay, that takes care of business and the sisters and money. <laughs> <laughs> so my purpose of sharing my testimony with you um, is very deep in my heart. It grieves me when I came to learn that 70% of Americans Catholics don't believe in the true presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Unfathomable. Um, so my purpose here is to share with you what happened to me, just an average regular person, to help you to see that there are times in the, in the, in the world that Almighty God will turn aside, pull aside the veil of heaven to reach down and touch a human being for his purpose, his glory, his reasons. So uh, I don't know why he chose me. I don't know why I was healed other than I think that the Lord knows me better than I even know myself. And he knew that one day, many days, I would be able to stand up and share my testimony, my truth with you. And I'm not afraid to do that. Back in the day, my knees used to shake a little bit because, you know, uh, there's a lot of reasons why. And it, it was uh, a big thing, and it is a big thing. And, you know, just what are people going to say? Who are, who's going to believe me and all that? So I don't care. You know, today, we're at the Shrine of Jesus, the Divine Mercy, here in Michigan. And it's holy, and it's wonderful, and it's beautiful. And so I want to communicate with you, my sisters and my brothers, the reality of God's presence with us in the Holy Eucharist, the way that he invented or made for us so that every single time we come to Holy Mass, we can receive in the fullness his holiness. That's it. So often we overthink things. We think things got to be so difficult, like a million times harder than what they are. Jesus said my yoke is light. You know, it's a no-brainer. Do this. Follow me. And it's a no-brainer. You can have this. So, let me begin. When I was 19 years old, I had my firstborn child, my only son. He died just before childbirth. And it was devastating. Uh, you know, especially at 19. You're on top of the world. You're at your best, you know. What could go wrong? Well, it went wrong. And, and, and so he, he, he was born dead. And, and my husband and I, of course, were just broken. I mean, and he was my only son. Okay. So here we are years later, and I'm delivering my fourth child, Elizabeth. And, um, you know, I, I, 
already had been it, been through this four times. So by this time, I was I knew what to expect for the, the, the cesarean section. I was well prepared. This time, though, this time, 29 years old, having gone through it three other times, now the fourth time, I walked into the hospital with two large suitcases. So I had my hot rollers, my curling iron, a, a nightgown for every different day with flowers and pink, whatever color I, I was in the mood for, uh, little snacks, things, okay? So I, I had everything under control until something went radically wrong during surgery. An intern came in to help the doctor, just out of the blue, and whatever happened, I don't know technically what happened, but whatever he did caused my obstetrician to say, oh my God, you should never have done that. And from that point on, it was how. I was hemorrhaging profusely, so much so that as the nurses and doctors were coming in and out of the room, they were calling everybody in, they were literally slipping in it. And so the doctor even said, I'm pumping blood. You know, it's like you're almost not there. They're talking to each other or whatever. And yeah, we're just pumping blood into her to keep her alive. So in the midst of this, I had, um, what do they call it? Um, a spinal. Spinal? You know, so that I was totally awake, but from underneath my breast down, you know, of course I couldn't feel anything. So I was, so the doctor at some point, they had been conferring and going back and forth, and the doctor at some point came real close to my face and said, Catherine, you're not going to make it. In fact, it'll be a miracle if you make it through the next hour and a half, two hours. While you're coherent and awake, I need for you to make arrangements for your two children at home and the newborn in the nursery. While you're coherent and awake, okay? So the anesthetic did not affect my brain as far as being coherent and awake. And I just remember looking at him and thinking and just looking around, I just came in to have a baby, you know? Um, how can this be? How can this be? Anyway, where's God? Where's God? Because I wear the scapular of Our Lady. I pray the rosary every day. How could I be dying? And then again, I need for you to sign the papers, etc. And I just couldn't do it. You know, I just I couldn't do it. And I, I, all I could do is start to pray out loud. Our Father, who art in heaven. And I jumped to the Hail Mary, and I'd go back and forth. And I don't know if I even finished the prayers, right? And at some point, there was a break in time where they, they were in and out, and I had a split second. I don't know how much time. Uh, but immediately, in this split moment, Our Lady appeared to me on my right side. And I just remember, and I could see it in my eyes, her beauty. I have never seen, and I've been all over, Rome, I've been to Jerusalem, Poland, so many. I've never seen any image of Our Lady that is as strikingly beautiful, naturally, as the Blessed Virgin Mary. Like nothing we've ever seen, really. And immediately I cried out to her, Blessed Mother, I beg you, go before the throne of God. And beg for me, because I knew that I knew that I knew that I was dying. I just knew I had no control. The doctors were all the specialists were there. I was dying. And she smiled at me. She just looked at me. And it was she was just beautiful. And so, you know, I was waiting for her to kind of levitate, maybe fly, <laughs> maybe, you know, give me her rosary. <laughs> something like you know, she did in the movies, and you know, uh, you know, I was waiting for something like that. So I figured she's not hearing me, and I and I and I cried out again to her. And mind you, you know, there's not a whole lot of energy there. I cried out, oh, Blessed Mother, I beg you, go before the throne of God and beg for me, because I knew if Mary asked, you wouldn't say no. Beg for me that I may live, to raise my family, be with my husband. I beg you. And she just continued to, just like Our Lady of Grace, just looking at me, smiling. 
a very soft smile. So finally, exasperated, I said to her, Blessed Mother, I too lost my only son. And although I didn't see him suffer the, things, the horrific things you had to watch Jesus suffer, I beg you, go before the throne of God and beg for me that I could raise my own children and be with my husband. I beg you. And she bent down and she touched me. I did not realize that I was already healed. I was already healed. I learned that about two years later when I was directing a retreat on Divine Mercy. I wasn't even talking about the Blessed Mother. And why? I don't know. But this instant ray of light, this instant uh, supernatural understanding came to my mind immediately in the, in the midst of my talk on mercy that it was the mere appearance of Our Lady that I was already healed. And when I thought, and I looked back on it, I realized, yeah, I didn't feel any more pain. I was alive. It was beautiful. But I just, you know, my humanness. But I don't regret it. Because it caused her to do the mother thing. And what do mothers do when their children have that kind of a problem? You know, there's a cry that you say, okay, come on, get up, you're fine, you know, keep going. But then there's that cry. That just makes a mother's brain crazy. It's like all you can think of is getting to that kid, right? Right? And so, you know, our lady just bent down and she touched me. And it was the most miraculous thing that ever happened to me. I never, I never had visions. I never heard anything. Nothing like that. Uh, it was the first time in my life. And it radically impacted me forever until I take my last breath. And so... Uh, it, you know, it, it was a, it, an amazing thing. My doctor came in again, and another doctor, and another doctor, and, you know, you're not going to make it. Uh, you know, it's a little improvement, but, you know, I said, no, I'm healed. I'm healed. Blessed Mother was here. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. <laughs> and so he looked at me. They're out. They looked at each other. He looked at me. And he, you know, he went, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when you'll sign these papers, I don't have to. I'm healed. I'm healed. And here comes my mother. My mother. Okay. She comes in with this box that was like this big, thick box of medals that her mother gave her. Right? So it's got every saint in there, big Blessed Mother medals, you name it, and all these spingalumis, all these pins. Right? And she starts pinning them all over. <laughs> By this time, I was taken out of the area and and put in a place where she, they would let her in because they had called my whole family and so my mother was allowed to come in and, um, and see me. And she started pinning all these things on my hospital gown, right? And she turned to them all and she said, don't you dare touch these medals. These are my mother's medals and they're gonna help her and if you need any help with them, I'll take care of it. <laughs> and I said, mom, mom, the blessed mother is here. I'm healed, I'm healed. And she said, I know I heard you, I heard you, beautiful. And so the doctor said something to her. And she said, you never mind, if my daughter said it, it's true. <laughs> God bless my mother. And so, uh, and it was, it was true, you know, for the next uh, three days I was, I was, they kept me in intensive care. My doctor never left the hospital. Boy, those were the days, huh? Yeah. Never left the hospital. He was right in the room next to me so that if anything would change in my circumstance, he would be able to take care of me. Um, and, and, and so there was a point in there that I, uh, I, you know, I realized that, you know, okay, I'm, I'm good and everything, but I want to see my baby. I hadn't seen my baby. We're on three days, right? And uh, finally... Um, you know, I had that talk with him, and I just said, you know, do what you need to do because I want to have my baby here, I you know, because I couldn't leave the room that I was in. So the next thing I knew, there was a crew in there, and they had cleaned it from top to bottom, and it was the first time they had an infant in wherever I was. And, uh, and they had a special nurse taking care of him. He was so happy. My doctor was so happy as I was elated. And I just, uh, you know, could not stop thanking God and Our Lady for her intercession. It was miraculous. And so, um, you know, I, I promised Blessed Mother as she was leaving, as I realized that she was just, and it's really beautiful, just kind of like, reminds me of uh, the Ascension, you know, or maybe the Assumption. When Our Lady just goes, it's like, uh, it, it, it just kind of dissipates. I don't know what you call it. But anyway, I, I sensed that in her. And I said, Blessed Mother, 
someday I'm going to do something good for Jesus. Someday I'll do something good for him. And I was thinking, you know, when I get on my feet and the, and the kids are, you know, I can do it. I'm going to teach catechism. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm going to have regular holy masses said in Thanksgiving. And I'm going to do that for Jesus, you know. And I did. I did. As soon as I could, I, I did. I started to teach catechism, and I loved it. I did it for years. I thought, you know, I'm in like Flynn. I got it down. And then um, one September morning, and it was a beautiful day, my husband got up and he took the girls, and I had three daughters, took my daughters out um, to see a job that he had done. He had to go pick up some forms. He used to do cement work. <laughs> and so he, he took them with him, which was rare. He never liked to take them on jobs because of nails and stuff like that. But anyway, it just so happened that it was the last day that the statue of Our Lady of Fatima was in our home. So every year we did that for, for a week or two weeks around the time of my birthday in September. And on this beautiful September morning, I had the door wall open in my dining room where I had the statue of Our Lady. And I, I said all my morning prayers. It was so peaceful. The kids were gone. I thought, yes, this is happening, right? <laughs> said my prayers and everything. And then I heard this. I got up from Our Lady. I put it down. I walked over to the table, the dining room table. Uh, it was separating some articles that I had purchased for my first Holy Communion class, and I was going to drop some off to my friend that I had picked up for her. And as I was putzing on the table, separating the stickers and stuff, I heard a voice, a strong voice, say, continue to pray. And I, I stopped dead in my tracks, you know, and I looked around and thought, oh, that's my husband outside teasing me, you know, because when he would see me pray, he'd say, oh, there you are in hallelujah again. <laughs> so I, he must be out there watching me and teasing me, you know. And um, so I walked over to the door wall, nothing, not even a bird, nothing. It was just, so I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I went back to doing it. I just totally ignored it, went back to doing what I was doing. And then a very, very powerful voice said, continue to pray. Now this time though, because I never heard anything like that, this time I know it was for sure. The first thing that came to my mind though was God spared my life through the intercession of the Blessed Mary when I had delivered Elizabeth, my, my fourth child, but he's coming for me now. He gave me a time to answer my prayer, to let me raise her up, teach catechism, do my promise, and this is just, because what would you think, right? And it was powerful. It was not like a gentle, kind, oh, pray. It was a, a very firm voice that said, continue to pray, like that. So that meant something big. So all I could think of was one thing. Getting from my dining room across the house to the statue of Our Lady of Fatima. Because if I was going to die, I wanted to die at her feet. And anyway, it helped me the first time. You never know what the Blessed Mother might do a second time. Right? <laughs> no joke, though. And so en route, I never made it to the statue. Probably halfway there. I lost all control of my body, and I was flat face down on the ground. I couldn't move a baby toe. I couldn't lift a finger. I never had anything like that happen to me in my life. And for a period of time, probably only moments, I was just completely paralyzed. And then within a second or two from that realization, I was lifted up and I, was, I stood up staring into the eyes of Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? And I just was there. I knew that I knew that I knew because while I was on the ground, I could see his feet, his pierced feet. So I knew that, it, but I knew anyway. I mean, you will know. I don't care where you're at or what time or when. When it's the Lord, you will recognize him. You will. There's no doubt at all. You will, as I did. And I was just standing there looking at him and looking in his eyes. He's so beautiful. So beautiful. In my whole being, my whole countenance, was just this peace. That's all I could say. 
but the fullness of peace in love. So he looked at me and he said to me, Catherine, I desire a total healing of every strata of the church. And I was just looking at him. And he went down each category, beginning with the priesthood and what was going to be happening, what's coming down the pipe. This was back in 1992. All the things that were going to be happening in the priest, in the church, the religious, all the way down to what he called the massacre of the holy innocents by way of abortion. Worse than in the time of Herod. And I just, I just stood there listening like, I never, at that time, 1992, I didn't even know we had any problems in our church. I didn't know that we had the problems that, that existed with our priests and religious, etc. I knew about abortion for sure, but I didn't know about any of the other things. I said to him, Jesus, I'm a sinner. It, I, what he was saying was so far out of my range, so far out of my comprehension, I, I couldn't even talk to him about that or say anything or respond. But in such holiness, such peace, such love, such light, for not only me but the world, all I could think of how how much of a sinner I am. And within moments, I don't know what you call it, I call it spiritual open heart surgery because it was like my whole interior was in front of me in God. And every single sin I ever committed was right in front of us, between us. I saw when I was smoking my dad's Lucky Strike cigarette in the basement when they were watching TV, and I got in trouble for that, they found out. When I was later, you know, at Kmart's, and the sale rack was right next to the rack to the skirt that I wanted, and so I switched the price on it because they were just right next to each other, and who really cares, it's Kmart kind of thing. Never, had, never thought about it. Um, everything, everything. And all I could think of is how horrible I was and what these bad things that I did. And Jesus just turned his head sideways, and then he looked back at me, and his eyes were like half filled with tears, like he was holding it back. And I knew, I knew he was holding it back for me, because if Jesus, if I would have made him cry, that would have been it. I would have been paralyzed on the ground for sure. I don't think my heart could, I know my heart couldn't take it. But he didn't let that happen. And, and it was just, it's, it was an amazing back and forth. And you know what he did? He just continued to talk to me. He just continued. It was like it was acknowledged. It was healed. I felt like the, the, the world had been lifted off of me. I can't even express the feeling. I had this joy in my heart. It was like, it was just, it was heaven. And it was real and it was true. And it changed me. I couldn't even think about ever doing anything like that or the things that you know, were in the past, the sins and such. All I could think about is him in this experience. And so at the very end of it, of all of it, and for me it was just like mentally just putting things on shelves because I, it was way over my, my understanding. And I just like, Lord, I don't know anything about any of this, what you're talking about, and that we even have problems like that. How, who am I, what am I going to do about any of that in the world and the priests and stuff? And uh, so it was just like, just kind of put it on the shelf. And um, he started to go away like Blessed Mother did. And I just couldn't bear for him to leave. I just couldn't bear for him to leave. I just wanted one more minute. Just one more minute, because it was so supernatural. It was just so out of this world. And so I turned to him, and I said to him, Jesus, will you bless me? And he looked at me, and he touched his heart, and he raised his hand. Hey, eh? Divine mercy. I didn't know anything about divine mercy back then. And he blessed me. And, you know, it was, it was so powerful. And he said, Pray the chaplet of divine mercy. He left that with me, which I never heard of. I didn't know what that was. Some special prayer, I guess. And um, and it, and it was gone. It was done. He was gone instantly. 
And so, um, you know, I remember coming to it, and there was so much that happened. There was so much that happened after that and to the point that I was actually able to get up and, and, and get going on what he had commanded or asked me to do, called me to do. And it was a, ma a massive uh, effort of trust. Um, and so it's like, who, who am I? I didn't tell my husband because I couldn't even imagine what he would think. I could talk to anybody who would understand. Um, and, but back in those, that, those, that time, I used to walk every day at, you know, um, the mall over here. It used to be Macomb Mall. You know, we used to be Sears here. And so every morning I'd walk with a friend after we dropped the kids off and we'd walk around saying our rosary and get our exercise in. And so she was a very dear friend of mine. Um, and she just said, what's up? You know, you seem kind of quiet, you're different, whatever. And this was after months. And finally it was like, it just, I said, I have to talk to you. And we sat down on the bench and I told her, you know, Jesus appeared to me. And this is what happened. And she was like, looked at me. She was dead silent. And she said, Kath, you just got to do it. <laughs> just do it. Because what he had asked was, what the Lord, one of the things that the Lord said was that I was to go to um, a priest under the seal of confession and share with him everything that I had shared with him. It's all in my book. There's a lot of stuff um, that I don't even have the time to go into today. But um, she said, you just got to do it. And so that was a whole nother trauma, uh, it, you know, experience. But it, it was a very good experience. And it, it led to my very first spiritual director and a long history of things, of revelations and such that have happened over this time and who God led me to, the Cardinal, Archbishop Vigneron, etc., etc., and the revelations that have taken place that only God could know. Only God can know. Only heaven. You know, just the, the, so it's, it's not something that is a fluke or you know, someone's being nice to somebody. Absolutely not. This ministry is not for wimps. Oh, no, 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 no. Ministry is not for wimps. And the stuff that I went through was really, really tough over the years. But God gave me the supernatural grace, as he will anyone that he calls. And he calls every one of us that we may hear and then epitha, and then proclaim the glory. That's the reason why. And that's why we have to be strong and bold and know God and take that time with him. Because he called, we all have this call, different but together. And so, you know, when that time came, and I, and I had to, you know, share the messages and do whatever, you know, the Lord put on my heart, and step by step, the first Divine Mercy Center, and then the Lord put it on my heart to start a women's community of sisters. It's, I mean, that was years ago. And I thought, not me. I thought, you know, the Lord just, he has this way. Jesus has this very funny way. Funny. It's like he gives you hints of things. So that you take the next step, and then the next step, and then boom, you know. No, it's you. Go do it, you know. Follow me. Whatever it is. That's how he does it. He gives us it, and, you know, we step out, and he gives us the grace to do it. But anyway, he had revealed that one day there would be a, you know, a community of sisters named the, the Sisters of Jesus' Merciful Passion. So beautiful. So holy. So beautiful. So for our times. So radically different. And I thought, yeah. Oh, gee, that one day, they're probably a hundred years after I'm dead, there's going to be some holy nun that's going to raise up this order, you know, this 50 million sisters and all this. And the call came. The Lord put it on my heart in prayer. You, I want you to start this community. I'm just average, okay? Um, so, you know what I said? Honestly. Lord, Lord, I don't even know what nuns wear under their dresses. <laughs> I don't know what kind of clothes, what, what goes on over there. How am I going to do it? I don't know. I'm a married lady. I got grandkids. You know, what do I, I don't know anything about this. And, but he didn't want me to know everything. It's a problem with everything today. He didn't want the run of the mill. He's calling something different. He's calling for something new. And he's calling for something good. Not only in the sisters, but in our times. When we face these radical different days of our life, and this pandemic, and all the anger, and the confusion, and the fear, and all the garbage, 
God is doing something great and wonderful in all of this. And God will bring good out of this. So what is it? What, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be faithful. We are supposed to be focused on him and trusting in him and not giving in to fear. Through this whole pandemic, and we still continue to meet with people. That never, sickness, uh, cancer, divorce pending, all kinds of things like Father was talking about, that didn't stop. And so what would Jesus do? You know, would he disconnect and say, whoa, <laughs> no, I got germs, you know? I mean, I didn't spit on anybody or their tongue or wipe mud in their eyes or anything like that. But if someone reached out, yes. And there was a hand in the heart for, of Jesus to, to connect with that person, to pray with that person, to give them that holy hope, that supernatural hope and encouragement that this ain't it. This pandemic is not it. It's a thing in this time. But God will do what God is going to do. If it's going to be in a car accident, God forbid. If it's cancer, God forbid. If it's tripping or whatever. When God calls someone home, he will call someone home. And I don't care if you're on a respirator or whatever else. If God wants you to be here, you will remain. And so our focus can never be the devil. It can never be the fear. Because Satan wants, through fear, to paralyze the people. You know, someone just told me the other day, do you ever think about, you know, all this mask stuff, you got to wear these masks and everything, and how you can't see people's faces? And I said, yeah, you know, I know. I said, when I was at the store the other day, and, and someone said, oh, I didn't even recognize you all, because, you know, and, I, and, and you know, it's like, what well, the doctors, yeah. And it's like, yeah, so he said, you know, did you ever think that God called us to be the likeness and image? He created us to be his likeness and image. And wouldn't it be just like the devil to just mask everything, keep your distance, don't be with the family, God forbid, and please, I don't mean anything. We all have to do what we feel comfortable with and safe with. And I'm all for that. I have no, no feelings or who's vaxxed, who's not, who wears shots, who's masked. That's, we have to be respectful of each other. Everybody has the right to take care of their health the best way they know how for their own body. And if you feel comfortable, then that's what's most important before God. You have to have peace. I'm just saying, a remark that made me think of just being closed off, away from, churches closed, no Eucharist. You know, I just can't imagine that that's what the Lord would want. I don't think our churches should ever have been closed. Now, we have to be careful, but there's ways of doing this. If they could keep them open and serve the people of God, mass and whatever during the plague, this is not the end of the world. And we have to realize in our days and our times, the objective of the devil is not the pandemic. It's to separate us from God. However, Families being split and torn apart, arguing, people driving and, and, and just being focused on themselves. You know, we, that's just like Father said, we could have a whole list of stuff, right? Let's don't be that. Let's do what Jesus does. We look, and this is what he taught me too, look at each human being through my eyes. If we look at each human being through the eyes of Christ, we can have love. And so, you know, the ones that are different from our thinking, um, we're different from others, and we don't care. It's, the Lord has to deal with each one of us. That's not our job. Thank God. We don't have to be God. We just have to love God. We have to love our and respect our neighbor. We have to be kind to each other. Because we're all hurting people, right? We've all been through a lot. And we still, there's a, a lifetime. There's a lifetime of beautiful, holy, and great opportunities ahead of us. God is going to do something very good out of all of this. All we have to do is be faithful. Keep going. Do not stop going to church and receiving Holy Communion. First, receiving confession. You know, confess our hearts. Have contrite hearts. Turn away from sin. Everything. Ask God. Give me the grace to exercise, Lord. Give me the grace to quit smoking, Lord. Give me the grace to be nice to that cranky person in my life.
give me the grace, whatever it is. I always ask God first for grace, because without, apart from him, apart from his grace, we can't do anything. Really, it's the truth. But when we ask for his grace, it changes everything. When we go to confession, there's something special about that walk from your seat to the pew to the confessional. The Lord loves that act of humility of us coming to him. It's our free will. He can't grab us and bring us in there. And, you know, He's not going to do that. He wants us to come to him. Come to me. Come to me with your burdens. Let me take that away like you took mine away. Freed me of all of it. It's amazing. So the spiritual life, you know, you're not just flesh. You're not just flesh. You're spirit. When we pass, when we leave this world, we go, our flesh dies, our spirit goes right, to, keeps going, goes to heaven, God willing, right? So I can back everything I've said up to you because of my life experience these past 30 years. My eyes have seen the miraculous. I've seen dead kidneys, my first miracle that I ever witnessed with my own eyes. Dead kidneys totally restored. I saw a massive, uh, what do you call that, um, bed sore. Massive bed sore, restored completely overnight. I've seen brain tumors healed. I've seen impossible situations, last breath, little child passing, and, and God restored that. I've seen the miraculous on so many. Even more beautiful, are the day-to-day -day healings, spiritual healings. When you see a person come in so heavily burdened from sin and whatever stuff, it's a ton of stuff out there, right? And you see a life completely turn around because of the Holy Spirit's work in that soul, with the connection, just like we're talking right now, about the reality of Jesus Christ and what he can do. The connection that's made in their life, the things or the words that's revealed, that only that soul knows that that's from God changes lives, spiritually changes lives, and that one person affects so many. That's, that's the glory of God. That's who you're sitting here today to hear about. That's why you do what you do that you do, because of God. You know, we all have a heart for the Lord, but what keeps us going day to day, what keeps us faithful when things are really tough, when the rubber hits the road, you know, it's not your circumstances, be it poverty, broken family, whatever it is. It's not those, sacri those circumstances that define you. That doesn't define who you are. What defines your character is how you respond in those situations. Where's your faithfulness? What is your response when the rubber hits the road? When there's a heartbreak or a turmoil or an abandonment or whatever the case may be, sickness. You turn your head to the Lord and you look at him and say, Lord, never let me be separated from you. Let this give you glory. Heal me, Lord. Yes, of course. Heal me, Lord. May your holy will be done. Every prayer should end with may your holy will be done. Because God knows exactly what we need and what is best for us, better than we realize. God can go way deep inside. And over the course of our lifetime and in his time, Reveal to us those things that need to be perfected within us. And by suffering, by our prayer life, by our sacrifices and penances we offer for others outside of our own self, right? Because it's very easy to get caught up inside of our pain. When we reach outside of that, looking through the eyes of God and asking him for the grace to do that, it changes your life. That's how you do it. And it all begins with reconciliation, a contrite heart and then Holy Communion, and only in that way. Because he is so good, because he is so holy, because he's the permanent result for us, God willing, we want to be in the best possible position before God. And finally, if you're between the ages of 18 and 40 and are considering the religious community here, I would love to talk to you. <laughs> We had to come and see one time a retreat uh, for, for women that were interested, possibly. And we had a bunch of married women sign up. <laughs> said, no, it's not that radical. <laughs> God bless you. God bless your families. Thank you for being here and for listening. I hope this enkindles your heart to a deeper faith and a trust in the Lord. And keep on doing what you're doing to serve him. Ask him for the grace, okay? 
We're going to have prayer ministry available. We're going to pray the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. If you're if you're hungry and you need to go, I, I, the food is ready for you, and you can come back in for prayer minister prayer ministry. They will be with us today, anyhow. Okay. But first, we're going to pray the Chaplet of Divine Mercy for the intentions that you are holding in your heart. Thank you again. God bless you. Thank you.